transgender debate. The Trump administration eliminates an Obama-era rule that defines sex as gender identity. We're at the White House. Abortion battle. A federal lawsuit is filed in an attempt to block Alabama's pro-life law. Stepping aside, British Prime Minister Theresa May announces her resignation. We'll have analysis on what it means for the future of Brexit. And history in the making. The Vatican launches a women's soccer team. We'll talk to its manager about the group's goal. On EWTN News Nightly for Friday, May 24th, 2019. Good evening from Washington, D.C., and thank you for joining us for News from a Catholic Perspective. I'm Wyatt Goolsby, in for Lauren Ashburn. The Trump administration proposes a new rule to protect doctors from violating their beliefs. The regulation says physicians would no longer be forced to perform transgender surgeries if they have ethical objections. White House correspondent Mark Irons reports. Good evening, Mark. Good evening, Wyatt. Doctors cannot discriminate against patients based on their race or sex. When President Obama was in office, he expanded that definition to include gender identity. Now President Trump wants to roll back those regulations so doctors aren't forced to perform surgeries that they think will actually harm patients. Before he left for Japan today with the First Lady, we asked President Trump about the issue. Should doctors be forced to perform transgender reassignment surgeries? We're going to see. Well, Monica Burke with the Heritage Foundation says today's action is about changing an unlawful regulation made by the Obama administration. They tried to reinterpret sex to also include gender identity, basically bypassing Congress in this move. A federal judge ruled against the regulation. If it had gone into effect, Burke says it could have required objecting health care providers to take part in sex change operations force doctors, nurses, hospitals, insurers to perform, to pay for, provide these controversial transition affirming therapies. And no healthcare professional should be forced to act against their conscience or their best medical judgment. An attorney from Beckett, which is helping protect conscience rights, tells us it's not uncommon for agencies to propose a rule and never finalize it. So they're closely watching this case. That's part of why we're continuing pursuing a final ruling in court, because the government has shown that uh, it doesn't always move on its own. Sometimes it needs a ruling from a court before it will do the right thing. Opponents accuse the Trump administration of trying to erase the rights of gay people. But Roger Severino, who heads the Health and Human Services Office for Civil Rights, says everyone deserves to be treated with dignity and respect, and we intend to fully enforce federal laws that prohibit discrimination. White, I'm told this rule would not discriminate against transgender people from receiving medical care. It would also not prevent them from having a sex change operation, just not with providers who oppose the procedure, Wyatt. Mark, is this new rule now in effect? No, it now enters a 60-day public comment period, and we can undoubtedly expect court challenges as well, Wyatt. And we'll be following that. White House correspondent Mark Irons reporting. Thanks, Mark. Abortion providers file a federal lawsuit to block Alabama's new pro-life measure. Planned Parenthood and the ACLU filed a suit today on behalf of the providers. The Alabama law was passed early this month. It would charge doctors who perform an abortion at any stage with a felony punishable by up to 99 years in prison. The measure is expected to take effect in November. Missouri Governor Mike Parson signs a heartbeat bill. It bans abortion after eight weeks. Doctors who violate the cutoff would, could face 15 years in prison. The measure could take effect by the end of August, though a legal challenge is expected. The House of Representatives fails to pass a $19 billion aid bill to help victims of hurricanes, flooding, and wildfires. The money that has been on hold for months will now be on hold again. Disaster bills are usually bipartisan, but this one hit snags in a deeply divided Washington. Capitol Hill correspondent Jason Calvey was in the House chamber. He joins us with the details. Jason? Why, it's, this money will go to southern states and Puerto Rico devastated by hurricanes. The flood soaked Midwest and fire ravaged California. Now, a sticking point in negotiations recently has been over more than $4 billion the president wanted to use at the border. He relented and the Senate quickly passed this bill. Most House members yesterday booked it out of D.C., starting their Memorial Day break. 
But then the Senate approved $19 billion to help disaster victims. The A's are 85, the nays are 8. Today the House opened up for what's called a pro forma session. In a nearly empty chamber, I pledge allegiance. Democrats tried to pass the disaster bill by voice approval. I ask unanimous consent. It would have passed as long as no one objected. Reserving the right to object. And that's all it took to block the bill. I believe that uh, the people's house, in the people's house, we should vote. Uh, I believe that we should have had the vote yesterday. I think the speaker should have held us here. We could have had a debate, we could have voted. Republican Chip Roy of hurricane hit Texas previews that debate. Well, number one is 19 something billion dollars on offset. We're racking up $100 million of debt per hour. It's fiscally responsible for us to continue to just write checks that we can't cash. Number two, uh, the bill doesn't deal with border security. The bill should deal with border security because we've got a crisis at our border. Democrat Donna Shalala of Florida tells me no one should have objected. I'm very disappointed. I'm disappointed for the people of Florida who have been devastated uh, by floods and by rain and whose homes have been destroyed. I'm disappointed for the people of California and the people of Texas who have been affected. This isn't the first snag for this disaster bill. The president originally fought money for Puerto Rico. But the main point here is that we insisted that Puerto Rico get the aid it needed along with the rest of America, and it is. Some of that would help rebuild the American territory's schools and hospitals. Now, Democrats will likely try to pass this bill once again next week during the Memorial Day recess using that unanimous consent approach. But all it will take is just one Republican to block it. Now, storm victims will eventually see this money. They're going to have to wait for the full House to return in June and have a roll call vote. And at that time, we expect this bill to pass. Wyatt? Jason, do you know if the president will sign it? Yes, he says he totally supports the bill. He says he wants to help his farmers that have been devastated by these, by these uh, natural disasters. He says he'll eventually get his immigration money later. In fact, that money to take care of immigrants detained at the border is running out. So this will be a pressing issue for lawmakers when they return from this Memorial Day recess. And I'm sure disaster victims in the meantime are hoping to get the money. Capitol Hill correspondent Jason Calvi reporting. Thanks, Jason. The United States files new charges against WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange. Officials at the Justice Department says Assange violated the Espionage Act. They cite his publishing secret documents containing the names of confidential military and diplomatic sources. Assange currently is in custody in London. His lawyer says the new charges are unprecedented and endanger all journalists. Iran's foreign minister lashed out today at President Trump. Mohammad Javad Zarif, shown here on the left, says, quote, Iran see, will see the end of Trump, but he never will see the end of Iran. The minister was speaking during a visit to Pakistan. Tensions are on the rise between the U.S. and Tehran. The White House sent an aircraft carrier to the region to deter a perceived threat. And today, President Trump announced an additional 1,500 troops are headed to the region. British Prime Minister Theresa May announces she will step down. This after she faced pressure from her own party to quit over her failure to remove the UK from the European Union on schedule. It is and will always remain a matter of deep regret to me that I have not been able to deliver Brexit. It will be for my successor to seek a way forward that honors the result of the referendum. To succeed, he or she will have to find consensus in Parliament where I have not. May officially steps down as leader of the Conservative Party on June 7th. Joining me now is Dr. John Fonte, senior fellow at the Hudson Institute. He's also an expert on international law and transnationalism who's written about the implications of Brexit. John, welcome to the broadcast. Thank you. Prime Minister has tried three times to get British lawmakers to approve her Brexit deal. Now that she's announced her resignation, what happens next politically and with Brexit? Well, it looks like a, a showdown is coming. For one thing, there's uh, elections to the European Parliament. If uh, Boris Johnson wins with the Brexit Party, which looks like it's possible, uh, then there'll be tremendous pressure on the Conservative Party, the Tories, uh, to move in, in the direction of Brexit. The whole, the whole question now is, uh, will they just leave? It's been going on for three years, essentially. Mm -hmm. They promised to leave in June of, of 16. Uh, and then all of a sudden there was discussion, well, we need a deal. We need permission from the EU to get out. 
Uh, Daniel Hannan, who's a member of the European Parliament, said, this is a little bit like the Continental Congress in 1776. says, well, we'd like independence, but we have to have a deal with King George III before we get out. <laughs> That's the kind of situation they're in. So I think now it looks like maybe a new leader, someone like Boris Johnson or a, a Brexiteer who will finally... Uh, give the uh, British people what they've been we're promised three years ago. Well, speaking of new leadership and making her announcement, the Prime Minister talked about the need for compromise. Do you think that's anywhere near obtainable in the situation? Uh, the, the European Union itself has uh, uh, not been willing to compromise. They've, uh, they've said Britain must remain um, essentially regulated. They still have to be regulated. There's, uh, they can't have their own trade deals. They have to, uh, the European Union is dictating a border with Northern Ireland. So they've been intransigent. And the whole idea of Brexit was to, uh, to control your own economy, to join the World Trade Organization, to have a deal perhaps with the United States, uh, with Canada, with Australia. In other words, Britain would be, there's this talk, well, it's bad to crash out of the European Union. They would be sort of like Canada or the United States or Australia. They're an independent country uh, making their own train deals uh, and their own relationship, bilateral relationships with other country. It would be a normal country. Right. So you say there's so many implications, obviously, for trade and stuff like that. But how, what do you think is the broader impact on Europe of the British prime minister in general stepping down? Well, this, this highlights probably the great question of our time. It's also being repeated in the European elections is who governs, who rules, uh, the people of a democratic state or supranational organizations like the European Commission, something that's above of the nation state. Who governs? The oldest, the oldest question in politics. Mm -hmm. And that's, those are the very broad implications. So they'll, they'll get a new prime minister and a, probably a stronger one. Like I say, so many implications here, not just trade, but politically and, and everything else. Dr. John Fonte, senior fellow at the Hudson Institute, thanks so much for your analysis Thank today. You. At least two people are dead after a bombing at a mosque in Afghanistan. The blast detonated during weekly Friday prayers in Kabul. It also wounded 16 people. No militant group immediately claimed responsibility, but both the Taliban and ISIS regularly stage attacks in the country's capital. Another mosque was attacked today in Pakistan. One person is dead and 15 others are wounded, three of them critically. The bomb was set off remotely. No militant group immediately claimed responsibility. The leader of Italy's League Party appeals to his supporters' Catholic sensibilities ahead of Sunday's European Parliament elections. Matteo Salvini is in favor of tough laws on migration. He's also reminded the crowd he supports crucifixes in schools. The King of Thailand opens the country's first parliament in five years. The group had not met since a military coup in 2014. Its first major business will be to select speakers this weekend. A prime minister is expected to be named next week. Coming up, moving forward, we'll talk to a man who says Theodore McCarrick sexually abused him about new leadership in the Archdiocese of Washington. Welcome back. I'm Wyatt Goolsby and for Lauren Ashburn. This week's installation of Archbishop Wilton Gregory as Archbishop of Washington, D.C., the first African-American to be appointed, brings with it a new beginning. Our recent sorrow and shame do not define us. Rather, they serve to chasten and strengthen us to face tomorrow with spirits undeterred. The 71-year-old Gregory served previously as the Archbishop of Atlanta. He becomes the seventh arch Archbishop of Washington. Joining me now to give his opinion on the new Archbishop is James Grind. James has admitted publicly that he was sexually abused at a young age by one of the former Archbishops of Washington, Theodore McCarrick. James, after Theodore McCarrick was defrocked, Pope Francis accepted the resignation of Cardinal Donald Worrell. How do you feel now that we have a new archbishop who says he wants to talk to survivors, be active in the community? Well, it's a very big positive step forward. You know, it's a great opportunity for the African-American uh, Catholic here in the diocese uh, to really step forward and feel united together. Um, and I believe that we are going to have a new chance in Washington, D.C. You've talked on the program before about the trauma that you 
uh, felt after the sexual abuse experience and how it impacted your life. What do you say to other victims of clergy sex abuse who have feel like they've lost direction in their life uh, and may still be struggling? I believe I tell them all, all the time is that the, the church that, that abused us were men. And my church is Jesus Christ. And you have to remain faithful to Jesus. And you need to pray every single day, fast as often as you can, and meditate. And that's what I do on a daily basis. And it has helped me greatly. And so I, I, I have a group of people now that I talk to on a regular basis who are struggling with that. And it's, it's been actually a gift for me so that it gets me out of myself a little bit more to help somebody else, which is, you know, tremendous. Your faith has inspired you to help those who are less fortunate. You recently traveled to Thailand to volunteer to help farmers there. Tell me about what the situation was like there and why you wanted to go. Well, I wanted to go because I, I needed to be distracted from all the mess that was sitting in my head. Um, I was tremendously distracted by uh, all the trauma that had, had I'd been living, and I needed to go someplace else. And the year prior to, uh, to this, I had met a young lady in, uh, in Bangkok, and she was a, a farmer. And she helped me buy something, and because she could know she knew Thai and she knew English, she says you should come out to my house. I live I don't live in Bangkok. I live up in the farm country, and I went there, and uh, there was whole community was was struggling because there wasn't enough water, and they never had a break, and they they, they live on pennies a day, and I thought to myself, I said, well, let's try to dig a well. Let's try to dig a well. Maybe we can get 90 acres of land back into a into a usable situation. The man who had been working on this land for 37 years was, was sad. He was, he was thinking he was going to lose his farm to some corporate America or corporate Thai or corporate uh, European situation. And uh, he was holding on for dear life. So we started to dig a well and we went down 35 meters. We struck water, but the water was no good. And they got sad. And I said, well, we've got to keep going. We're not stopping here. And so thanks to your efforts, you were able to drill, I believe you told me, two wells? Two wells. And it's covering 90 acres of land. And it's, and it's uh, they're, they're planting corn, they're planting rice, they're planting fruit trees, they're doing everything. There is a new hope. So this farm impacts a half a million people. Just one example of you trying to volunteer to help others uh, because of you being inspired by your faith. James Grind, thank you for sharing your story. I'm sure there's many clergy sex abuse survivors who appreciate your efforts. Thank you, Wyatt. Michigan prosecutors announced the filing of sexual abuse charges against five former priests. The charges are part of the state attorney general's investigation into clergy abuse going back decades. The priests served in Detroit, Lansing, and Kalamazoo. Also in Michigan, Pope Francis has named Bishop Robert Gruce to be the next leader of the Diocese of Saginaw. Gruce succeeds Bishop Joseph Sistone, who died last year. Bishop Gruce has served as Bishop of Rapid City, South Dakota, since 2011. Up next, a new soccer team kicks off at the Vatican. We'll talk about the team's goal. Tanti definiscono il calcio come il gioco più bello del mondo. Pope Francis says soccer is the best sport in the world. The Holy Father was speaking to 5,000 young players at the Vatican. He says the great thing about soccer is it requires teamwork to succeed. Welcome back, I'm Wyatt Goolsby, in for Lauren Ashburn. There's some more soccer news coming out of Rome. The Vatican has launched a women's soccer team. The squad is comprised of Holy See employees, plus the wives and daughters of workers. Local media report the team will travel to a tournament in Austria next month. Susan Volpini, the team's manager and secretary of the Women in the Vatican Association, joins us from Rome. Susan, a men's team at the Vatican has existed for 48 years. How was the women's team formed? Um, actually, we've been, uh, we have existed for about a month and a half now because um, the idea started last year and at the last family day that was held in June of 2018. Just for fun, there was a, a female soccer game and a couple of months ago, the Danilo Zennaro, who is the uh, secretary of the association sport in the Vatican, came to our association to ask if someone just wanted to, to hang on to this idea and, and start a women's soccer team, and that's how it all started. Very exciting. Well, in March, the founder and the entire editorial board of a Vatican women's magazine quit, citing a climate of distrust against women inside the Vatican. What has been your experience working in the Vatican? Well, I've been in the Vatican for 26 years, and I must say it's an honor to, to serve the Holy Father and, and and the Vatican, and I've always had 
great, um, a great experience in all the years I've been working in the Vatican. So I have never had problems of any sort. And, I'm, and I hope, hope to, to, to work still many years in the Vatican serving the Holy Father. And to that end, Pope Francis and his advisors say they want to increase the presence of women in the Vatican. What does that mean to you and, and why is that important, do you think, in your view? Well, of course, um, <clears throat> the, the female genius, as he, would, as he mentioned more than once, um, is very important. The women should, should be um, added to the Vatican where we are needed because not all positions are for women, but I'm sure that the the Holy Father and, and to the Secretary of State will think about taking on new women if needed and when needed. So this is an honor also um, to be able to, to also, um, apart from being a mother or having other jobs to serve the, the Vatican, that is usually considered a man's world. But it's, it's not always so because there are many nuns and consecrated women and lay women who already serve in the Vatican. So. We're happy about that. Susan, tell me a little bit more about the women's soccer team. We've been seeing some photos of them. Just tell me a little bit about them. Um, it's a great group of girls. We have uh, girls from 23 to women who are around 50. So we have all ages and from all different offices. Uh, about 60% uh, work in the Vatican, whereas 20% are wives of people that work in the Vatican, and another 20% are the daughters of those that work in the Vatican. So we have a great group of women, and I am meeting, after 26 years, I'm meeting a lot of women that I didn't know, and, um, and it is really an honor to wear that shirt uh, with the, the logo of the Vatican and, and represent the Holy See. So we're having a really good time, really good time. Glad to hear it. I'm sure it is an honor. Well, we want to be one of the first, at least, to wish you good luck on the first game, which is this Sunday as well. Susan Volpini, Teams yeah. Manager and Secretary of the Women yeah. in the Vatican Association, thanks so much for talking with us today. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Always great to see people coming together in a team environment. I'm sure the women's soccer team will gain a lot of supporters. And that wraps up our newscast for tonight and for this week. We thank you for watching. For the entire EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Wyatt Goolsbee. We'll be back Monday, Memorial Day, with a special edition of EWTN News Nightly. Good night, and God bless.